Wake up your morning in a brand new way with the positive people, places, events, and things in and around your neighborhood and around the world. No matter where you live, your mornings are about to get better. It's the refreshing way to start your day. No doom or gloom, just bright sunshine no matter what the weather. Metro Magazine with Bonnie McDaniel. Inspiring, informative, intelligent, ION. Positively the best way to start your morning. I'm Bonnie McDaniel and welcome to Metro Magazine. We're actually here today talking to a gentleman who has written a very exciting book, a gentleman by the name of Eric Royals. As you know, we've done a couple of interviews talking about the recent incidents of police shootings across the country and so we're still in that space and I am so excited to talk to him today uh, because he has a lot of great information to share especially for African-American men. So Eric, the name of his book by the way is Encounters with the Police, A Black Man's Guide to Survival. Welcome to Metro Magazine, Eric. Um, boy, I can't wait to delve into this subject but I want to talk to you a little bit more because I learned that you have really have first-hand knowledge of encounters with the police. So why don't you give us a little bit of background, and then we're going to come up and talk about your educational background and bring it forward to the book. Sure. Thank you for having me today. Mm -hmm. So um, my uh, initial sort of experience with police was as a, as a juvenile delinquent in my hometown of mm -hmm. Hamilton, Ohio. <clears throat> and you said you were 10 years old. That kind of threw me. So talk about what, what was going on, what were the circumstances, and why did you find yourself in trouble with the law? Yeah, I, I grew up in a rough and tumble neighborhood mm -hmm. and basically trying to mimic the behavior of my peers. Okay. I started to engage in uh, misconduct as a, as a youth. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the story that I talk about in the book, Encounters with Police, uh, Black Man's Guide to Survival, is uh, an incident that I actually had uh, a year before my arrest with police where I was actually nine years old and got called the n-word by a police officer as I cut in front of their vehicle on my uh, dirt bike. I was okay. riding my bicycle, I cut in front and uh, the police officer called me over, chastised me for doing that and then used the n-word. Mm -hmm. Part of my sort of resentment for police obviously stemmed from that incident, okay. and uh, I actually held a lot of resentment, and that uh, uh, slur replayed in my mind over and over and over again for about a year. And about a year later, at the age of 10, I actually tried to burglarize a police impound lot. I tried to <laughs> take a motorized mini bike back in the 70s and 80s. You would have these little mini mm -hmm. motorcycles. And uh, two of my buddies and I decided the police station had one and we were going to take it. Wow. Now, you talk about um, your encounter a year before you were actually arrested. Yes. And you shared, you shared that um, you had this police officer who called you a name. Mm -hmm. My question is, are these police officers, so that we can kind of give uh, our audience an, an opportunity to try to imagine what the situation might be or might have been, are these community cops or just, I mean, what was the relationship, if you will, with the police officers? Were they, you know, uh, members of the community? Were they people who just came? Just kind yes. of give me a little bit of, of a background. So the city where I grew up, Hamilton, was largely a segregated community. The African Americans lived in one uh, quadrant of the town, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest of the town was populated by non-African Americans. Okay. Our community was being policed by predominantly white police officers got it, got during it. the 70s. So this would have, it would have been a younger police officer uh, mm -hmm. again. Uh, in, it was 1978, and uh, so not someone from the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you was this the first encounter when you were nine years old? It was the very first encounter I had with a police uh, officer or police of any sort was that encounter. So it really did make a, a really bad impression. So do you have older siblings or? I do. Okay, what had been their experience? Were they males or females? I have three, females? three older sisters, one older brother. Okay. I do recall a time where my three older sisters were accosted in a uh, department store and accused of shoplifting, and they were not, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, by an off-duty police officer who was working as security for the store. Okay. And so I do recall that incident. It, again, it didn't involve me. I was probably five or six. I was with them. Mm -hmm. So I do recall that incident, but again, my own 
where it was actually directed at me didn't happen until I was about nine. But yes, there were uh, a litany of stories from other people within the community, my relatives and friends, of having um, negative encounters with So you had officers. heard this as a nine-year-old? I did, yeah. Okay, okay. So then let's fast forward to your actual uh, experience and, and, and breaking the law with a friend. Talk to me about why and what were the circumstances that, that made you decide, okay, I'm going to do this, and what impact did the, the experience you had a year earlier have on that decision? Sure. Um, I, think, I think there are a few reasons that uh, I engaged in that behavior. I think mm -hmm. uh, the, the first thing is, again, you're, I was trying to fit in in, in okay. my neighborhood. And I was always a kid who was liked to read and liked to spend time in the library and liked to be scholarly. And even back then, people would say, oh, you're acting white. Are you, okay. you're like a, a uh, you're at, you act like a white boy because you read books and you, uh, you know, spend time in the library. Now, so who were you getting this from, people in your community? Or? My, my friends, okay. my friends, my neighborhood friends and uh, young boys that grew up in, in my neighborhood and who I wanted to be friends with and hang out with. Mm -hmm. And so um, in order to sort of rebut, you know, that uh, sort of presumption about me, I started acting out. Okay, so you were trying to prove a point, first of all, that, you know, I'm not white, whatever that means. Which is interesting, yeah. right? That, that yeah. that's how I tried to prove the point. Exactly, Shows. and then you were also getting rid of some resentment that you had built up because of the encounter and also the stories um, that you'd heard from relatives and friends about police. That's correct. So you were arrested. Talk about that experience. Yeah, it was a terrifying experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I was... I, I was put in the back of a cruiser mm -hmm. and taken to a station. I was put in a very small room, and I guess it was the first iteration of the, uh, the Scared Straight program because okay. the police officer was very tough with me, to, uh, and I think rightly so, to try mm -hmm. to scare me into proper behavior. And now, now you, you bring up an interesting point because you said you were 10 years old. Yes. Um, where, where were your parents? Where were the guardians in this process? Were your parents immediately notified that, hey, we have, okay, so, yes. okay, talk about that because I think it's an important point because I, if you look at some of the incidents that have happened recently, sure, especially as it has to do with, with young people who are underage, talk about that and what is the proper thing that, that should be done and what was your experience? Yeah, so as I recall it, I was taken back to the police station. Mm -hmm. I was put in a small room, interrogation room. Had your parents been called at this point? I, I wasn't aware of when they were called in the mm -hmm. process, but they probably showed up within the hour. Okay. okay. So they so were notified, did. yes, they were notified, and they were, uh, they did come down to sort of get me out within an hour of okay. the incident. So you're in a holding cell. Yep. Um, what happened after that? Well, I was... I was obviously terrified and frightened and the police officer said you're going to spend a lot of time in a cell this small, you're never going to see your parents again. So he did the whole routine of the bad cop routine to try to you know, really instill some fear in me to uh, hopefully deter me from engaging that, in that type of behavior again. And so um, my parents got there, obviously they were not happy. And, uh, <laughs> I would think not, yeah. Um, and so, but that's actually the sort of the beginning process of me thinking about being a lawyer because I remember my dad after we got home and my mother convinced him not to discipline me too toughly because mm -hmm. uh, she said, look, Howard, I'm a social worker. You can't beat this boy. <laughs> you know, so you need <laughs> yeah, to Yeah, that would have been a little strange. Yeah, it's a yeah. Bad, it's, it would not look good. And so yeah. uh, my dad just said, look, you're going to go into court and you're going to tell him what you did. And I said, you know, are you going to get me a lawyer? Because... I, there were TV lawyers back then. Mm -hmm. I knew that much that mm -hmm. people who went to court had lawyers. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, "No, you're not." He said, "What do you?" He said, "Innocent people need lawyers. I'm not going to give you a lawyer. You're going to oh, just wow. go in and tell the judge and take your medicine." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that process spurred me at 10 years old to start thinking about this notion of becoming a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was Napoleon that said two things motivate men, interest and fear. Mm -hmm. And certainly my fear of this sort of entity called the law uh, compelled me to kind of think about uh, understanding it, mm -hmm. uh, taking hold of it, and, and, and ultimately uh, becoming a, a lawyer, basically an advocate that I felt I didn't have as a 10-year-old. Okay, so you're 10 years old, you're going through this criminal process, and 
What did your life look like from there, from then on? Uh, were you, did you focus more on academics after that experience? Um, talk a little bit about your growing years. I want to bring up to the point when you entered college, and we're going to talk about the book in a moment. Sure. So, um, you know, obviously that initial year after, you know, the arrest and the conviction, mm -hmm. and I got sentenced to probation. I was not sent to a, a juvenile detention center. Okay. Uh, it was a tough year uh, for me, and it really, again, got me. So it was for a year, and what was the probation? Um, what, what did you have to do? I Community had to, service? Or? I had to be inside the house at 5 p.m. each day which meant I couldn't play on my boys club basketball team because mm -hmm. basketball practice was at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. I had to uh, check in with my probation officer. I had to go meet with my probation officer every Friday. I still remember it. Every Friday, mm -hmm. right after school, I would spend uh, an hour or so uh, talking about various things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it caused me to basically uh, give up all of my sort of extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I began to really think about, you know, the law and what is the law and why does it have such influence in our life. I remember going on a fishing trip with my dad one morning and it was probably five or six in the morning and we were driving and we were at a stoplight and there were no cars on the road. And I said, hey dad, why, uh, why are you stopping mm. at the stoplight? Because mm -hmm. there are no cars. And my dad said, because it's the law, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You stop at a red light and he said and besides son if you pay attention to the law you wouldn't be in the trouble that you're in right now <laughs> <laughs> so you know and I and I can't help but think you know how fortunate you were first of all that the situation did not turn out in a, in a very bad way yeah yes. you got in trouble yes. and you also had a male figure there to guide you and make you pay attention and and also more importantly own up to your actions um, so you finished, I'm, we're going to uh, speed along a little bit. You finished high school, went away to college. So talk about your college years and, and uh, you know, where did you go to school? Sure. I attended undergraduate uh, at University of Cincinnati. Okay. And um, I actually uh, did not do very well in high school. I actually graduated at the bottom of my class, probably 150 out of 150. Why do you think that was? I think it was a number of reasons. I think I felt conflicted in the community in which I lived. I, f I felt a... Uh, I saw a lot of uh, African Americans disenfranchised and, 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 and lack of power, and I, I did see various abuses occur in the mm -hmm. city from a, a number of in a number of different ways. I also had uh, difficulty at my high school. I went; my parents did put me in a private high school, mm -hmm. and there were you know it was probably uh, very few African Americans in the school. So I had some difficulties. There was various racial issues and things like that that I had to endure. And I think it demotivated me some, and so mm -hmm. I just didn't study much in high school. So I graduated uh, at the bottom of my class. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can't help but think um, and listening, and and because I used to do a lot of work with uh, teens and. This seems to be a very prevalent issue, especially when you have young people who have parents or guardians who are trying to do their best to, to help them to you know, be, become productive citizens, where on the one hand you have, you know, white people don't like you for mm -hmm. whatever the reason, right. and then your own disown you be, for, for, for whatever the reason. And this is usually very, very typical uh, where you just then you throw your hands up and do nothing. Yep. Yeah. So if you graduated at the bottom of your class, what was the process of your getting into college? Well, I, I did well on my on the SAT and ACT. Okay. So, so I you had the capacity, I just didn't work. So my scores, I went to the University of Cincinnati, I went to their two-year campus, right, Got it. to mm -hmm. sort of make the transition into main campus. Mm -hmm. I also ended up working full time uh, mm -hmm. during my college careers. I actually sold garage doors uh, to pay my way through college. Uh, okay. uh, decided to move out of my parents' home again. Oftentimes, my dad and I butted heads. He was mm -hmm. a very strong male figure, and I'm thankful to have mm -hmm. have a father mm -hmm. uh, to be raised by a true man. Mm -hmm. uh, where uh, there are kids nowadays that don't have uh, right. a father in the home mm -hmm. and, and have that influence. But because of my father and I butted heads a lot, because we were a lot alike, mm -hmm. uh, I decided to move out and uh, I got a small efficiency in downtown Cincinnati and I worked full time and uh, attended school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're going to take a quick break because I want to come back and talk a little bit more about your experience in college. What were some of the defining moments for you? Because you don't just wake up and do stuff like this. 
Sure. Uh, I want to talk about that. And we're going to come right back with more Metro Magazine. Up to 40% of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov slash business. If you're just joining us, we're here with Eric Broyles, who has written an exciting new book, Encounters with Police, A Black Man's Guide to Survival. And when we went to break, Eric, we were talking about, we were beginning to delve into your college years and how, and can kind of lay a path for us coming up to where you are right now with this book. Um, so you were sharing that you had a difficult time in high school and now you're in college. So talk about your college years and, and what were some, some of the defining moments um, that you can recall? Sure. So um, during my college years, as I mentioned, I worked a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I was, a, again, I sold garage doors. I paid 100% of my college tuition. I uh, double majored uh, in college and went what to were your majors? Uh, marketing and management. Okay. Uh, in the business, I was in the business school. Okay. Um, and so it was difficult. It was a difficult uh, run for me. It's actually when I developed the bad habit of speeding, right? Because I was working 20 hours a day to keep up with my life. And you had to get I, somewhere real quick. <laughs> yes. And so I would get pulled over by police. And oh, so wow. I started getting my encounters with police during my sophomore and junior year. At the same time, my childhood best friend, Adrian Jackson, became a police officer. Okay. And so it was uh, sort of during that time that he would ed started educating me on, hey, Eric, I know how hard you're working, mm -hmm. but you really got to change your speeding habits. But look, since you are probably going to get pulled over, mm -hmm. here's what I want you to do. So you guys, you really have been um, talking about this subject long before. 25 years we've been wow. on this topic. Mm -hmm. This is, this, Adrian first talked to me about how to deal with encounters in police in 1989. Wow. We were talking, wow. and he gave me pointers because he knew I was getting pulled over. He knew that I was, you know, rushing through the day. Mm -hmm. I had to run six to seven sales calls each day. And then I spent four or five hours in the library each night. And so I literally ate in my car in between sales appointments, mm -hmm. right, between mm -hmm. running in various parts of southwest Ohio. And so uh, during that process, so look, I learned a lot about myself. I learned about uh, my determination mm -hmm. uh, and tenacity, my ability to adapt, mm -hmm. and, and a commitment to a vision uh, that I have for my life. I mm -hmm. wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to be a business person. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was committed to doing everything that I needed to do day by day mm -hmm. uh, to make it. That meant selling doors. That meant spending five hours in the library. It meant getting very little sleep. And it meant... Uh, being safe when I did encounter police mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for, for my speeding. Uh, and oddly enough, Adrian's advice led to me getting off of a lot of tickets without me even asking to be let go. G give an example of something uh, that illustrates that. You said you, you got off of a lot of tickets. Was a it lot. because of Eric being there or because right. you understood how to make that happen on your own? Yeah, I, th I think what people I think miss and we again we talk about this in the book is police officers are human and mm -hmm. they have a very difficult and tough job mm -hmm. and oftentimes when they pull you over we think we're upset or we're angry that we're pulled over and so you don't treat them like a human so mm -hmm. I always gave officers respect and I always tried to let them know that hey I'm not a threat to you mm -hmm. because my best friend told me how concerned they all are about threats. So, so how do you let a police officer know that you're not a threat? You put your hands on the, you make your hands visible, right? You're a okay. threat with your hands. You grab a gun, you grab a knife with your hands. So you put your hands on the steering wheel, the first okay. thing you do, okay. right? You turn the lights on in the car if it's, if it's at night. And these are tips we have in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk in a calm and respectful manner, just mm -hmm. like any other human being would like to be spoken to. Now, let, I, I'm not a male, obviously, and I've had a couple of instances over the years where I've gotten pulled over. Sure. And one instance it was fine. Mm -hmm. the, the officer was very polite. The other one, he was a real hothead. Sure. How do you deal with someone who's being disrespectful, mm -hmm. who's speaking to you speaking to you in a very elevated tone? Sure. I mean, you talk about looking at the police officer as being human. There's another side. How does how do you get the police officer to look at you as a human being? Sure. The theme and the most important part of this book is mm -hmm. to remember to comply now 
contest later. So it, your feelings don't matter at this point because you've gotten pulled over then? At that point. Mm -hmm. there, here's what I really want young men, particularly African American men, to know. Mm -hmm. There is an inverse relationship to your hostility and your power. Okay. The more hostile you are when you encounter a police officer, the lower your power goes. Okay. You actually enable that officer to charge you with additional offenses, potentially d uh, disturbing the peace. You actually then give power to that officer to put handcuffs on you. And in the worst case scenario, when you resist or you raise it to a hostility, you actually empower that officer to possibly take your life. Wow. And so what I'm, I'm doing in this book is mm -hmm. I want to shift the mindset so that you realize your true power lies in other venues outside of the stop, mm -hmm. outside of the mm -hmm. encounter. Mm -hmm. In an instance where you were spoken to in an abusive manner, mm -hmm. um, I would say you have the ability to go to a police station and file a complaint. Okay. It's like you issuing a ticket to the police officer. Okay. Okay. The police department has a responsibility to respond to your complaint. Okay. They have to investigate the officer. They have, you have a right to know what the adjudication of it was. So you actually take power by remaining calm, mm -hmm. letting the officer vent. But let me, in terms of, again, understanding the police officer's job, okay. that police officer who pulled you over, let's mm -hmm. say you were speeding 30 miles over the speed limit. Mm -hmm. He may have been, he or she may have been really upset with you for that. What, what we often don't take into account as citizens is that same officer may have picked up a six-year-old girl who was ran over the day before by a driver going 30 miles mm, over the speed mm. limit. In my instance, just to, to uh, uh, give a little bit more background, I, had, I live in a county where there are like tons of stickers you need on your car to, you know, for different taxes or sure. whatever, and I had picked up my city uh, tax sticker and I threw it in my glove compartment. It was not on, on my tag. Okay. And so he didn't ask me if I, you know, had paid the, the uh, and had a new, tick, uh, new um, sticker. Sure. He came as though, and I mean, it was just really overkill. It was about a sticker, and I sure. said, officer, I said, if it's okay, I'd like to go in my glove compartment. I pulled it out and I gave it to him, and then he proceeded to really read me the riot act. Um, in that instance, I thought it was overkill, and mm -hmm. you're right. He probably, I knew it had nothing to do with me. That's right. He was probably upset about something else. Maybe he didn't want to be at work that day. Sure. But I think it's a prime example of how um, you take a situation that's very minor that's and right. you escalate it and it can happen. That's right. Due to a police over officer overreacting or a citizen overreacting to a situation that is, you know, really not a big deal. So. At the moment that police officer is being abusive towards you mm -hmm. for something as minor as not having a sticker, again, recognizing that you don't know why that officer was so upset sure. by that mm -hmm. event. At the moment that occurs, all of your power lies in you remaining mm -hmm. calm mm -hmm. and recognizing that in our book, Encounters with Police, A mm -hmm. Black Man's Guide to Survival, mm -hmm. we have many tools in there to redress uh, uh, and address police misconduct. Okay, so let, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You can file a complaint. Mm -hmm. If it gets egregious, for example, let's say in, in my instance, when I was a little boy and the police uttered the N-word, mm -hmm. you can file a lawsuit against a police officer for that alone, okay? okay, okay. For a violation of your, your uh, rights of equal protection under the law. Mm -hmm. We outline that uh, on our website, survivethepolice.com, mm -hmm. and also it's talked about in the book. So you have to make a decision at the moment of the encounter. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be right at that moment right. <laughs> and get, do you want to be right or do you want to go home? Right. 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 And preserve your ability to make the police officer pay in an appropriate form mm -hmm. through filing a written complaint, mm -hmm. through writing a letter to the mayor or to the county commissioner, through uh, reporting incidents to the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. So you have a number of outlets to express your rightful frustration mm -hmm. at police misconduct. Mm -hmm. You can make bad police officers pay, you can't make them pay on the spot, and you can't make them pay. They right. have to pay within the system. Through the process. Yeah. Now, let's go back a little bit because sure. we, got in, in, we got involved in, in different parts of the book. I want to know what <clears throat> motivated you and also Adrian Jackson sure. to write this book. Was it some of the recent occurrences that happened. Uh, we had Ferguson, we also had Staten Island. Yes. Um, 
what made you sit down? And I understood they took you, what, nine weeks to N write this? Nine weeks to write this. I commend you. I've written books before, and that's super fast. Yeah. So talk about that process, the conversation that was had, and, and you're stepping up and saying, you know what, we need to do something to save our men. Well, I was motivated for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. One, I, I'm friends with uh, a couple of the attorneys in these high-profile cases. Okay. So Ben Crump and Daryl Parks uh, for Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Ferguson are friends of mine. Okay. Uh, and so you discussed that with them? It's in, I, 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 I did. I discussed mm -hmm. after the Trayvon Martin verdict, we were in mm -hmm. San Francisco together and talking about it. And I asked at that time, what can we do to help <clears throat> our young men? To, uh, you know, not that Trayvon didn't do anything wrong, mm -hmm. but what, can, what advice can we give to uh, these young men to help them sort of navigate these uh, circumstances that can crop up? Mm -hmm. Then after, uh, then when John Crawford uh, was uh, shot inside the Walmart store, uh, my college classmate and very good friend Michael Wright represents that family. Mm -hmm. So he and I talked 25 times the, the day, you know, after he got that case. Mm -hmm. And so in hearing his frustration and anger and thinking about my conversations with my best friend Adrian, I thought we got to do something mm -hmm. to help educate these uh, young men to think about these encounters with police in a different way, mm -hmm. in a way that allows them to get home safely. So I was motivated simply to help young men, uh, unarmed men, get home safely. Mm -hmm. That's it. And to preserve life. Now you bring up an interesting point because Trayvon, unlike uh, the situation in Staten Island or the situation in um, and the Walmart, mm -hmm. you had a private citizen. Sure. What does a, because now it's like, I'm a citizen, you're a citizen, and you're accosting me, even yeah. though you have decided to deputize yourself to do that. Yeah. And no one was there except uh, the gentleman and, um, and Trayvon. What, what should he have, what, what should he have done in a situation like that? Well, because, again, because we only heard one side of the story, one side right. that I give very little credence to, in fact, right, right. Um, it's not clear. One thing that is clear is that Trayvon Martin didn't do anything to deserve to be dead. Right. Even if Trayvon Martin physically went after George Zimmerman first, mm -hmm. in order for the jury to reach the verdict that it did, mm -hmm. it had to presume that he did not have a right to, to self-defense, right. that he did not have a right to be afraid as mm -hmm. a 17-year-old boy mm -hmm. that a stranger is following him, mm -hmm. who we know from his witness account, he said, hey, I got this guy following me. So he might have been frightened. Mm -hmm. He may not have known the best way to handle it. Mm -hmm. But the jury had to make a presumption about the value of his life. Mm -hmm. I think the parallel between, I, I don't think y you can draw a parallel <coughs> with the actions right of police versus private citizens. Right. But I think the parallel is the valuation that we put on black male lives, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or the devaluation that we put on exactly. it. I think that I think that that jury made a value judgment, mm -hmm. and they ultimately said George Zimmerman's life had enough value that warranted a self-defense. So mm -hmm. we will give him the presumption of self-defense. And this look, this is legally this is the only way you actually reach this result. Mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin life. Trayvon Martin did not have the right of self-defense. That's mm -hmm. ultimately what the verdict says. As a legal matter, when you distill it down, mm -hmm. it's that he didn't have a right to defend himself. Mm -hmm. So as an attorney, and this is not to draw any, um, to say that, you know, his attorney, uh, Trayvon Martin's attorney uh, for his parents, was um, <clears throat> that he didn't do his job, but Hindsight is always, it gives you a different perspective. Is there something he could have done differently? Well, to be clear, uh, uh, Daryl Parks and Ben Crump had nothing to do with the criminal prosecution right. of okay. George Zimmerman. So let's be very clear on that. Okay. They did nothing wrong. They right. represent the family on a civil exactly. matter. Mm -hmm. The criminal case was held, handled by the state of Florida. Okay. So the, uh, the, those guys did nothing wrong. They did everything right mm -hmm. in terms of representing the family's mm -hmm. interests. Look, it, it was an unfortunate and horrific situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the underlying cause, I believe, is the same. Mm -hmm. It's how we view each other mm -hmm. and our, uh, un, I'll call it unconscious bias. I don't want to necessarily just label everyone a racist mm -hmm. uh, because, um, but I, I, we all have unconscious bias mm -hmm. and we all have this notion of what that person is like because mm -hmm. of how they dress or how they look or what this person is is like and so those those uh, un, those, those biases that we we carry can lead to uh, 
somebody following a young man who's doing nothing more than going mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. or uh, somebody uh, thinking that a young boy with a gun in a park in Cleveland, he must be a criminal. Right. 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 But that's, you know, he must <clears throat> be doing something bad. And so there's no, so he gets shot, Tamir mm -hmm. Rice. Um, and so I think the, uh, the undercurrent is, is something that's sort of deeply ingrained. And those are serious issues that need mm -hmm. to be dealt with. And mm -hmm. This book, however, does not deal with those sort of institutional racism type issues. Mm -hmm. We're keeping it very pointed and very mm -hmm. focused on what you do at the encounter mm -hmm. to make it home, mm -hmm. right? Our objective is to get you home, and then if your ego is bruised or if you got yelled at or treated disrespectfully, we actually tell you how you can get payback in a different form. Okay. We're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, I want to draw some scenarios sure. of possible encounters uh, that young men might have with police officers and then step through some of the things that they might be able to do to leave a life. Sure, happy. Okay? Yeah, happy and we're going to take another break and we're going to come back with more Metro Magazine. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Eric, when we went to break, we were talking about um, really delving into situations where young men might have an encounter with the police. Sure. But before we even go there, let's give a little bit of a backstory as to your education and things that really do help you to understand um, in a way that maybe a, another private citizen wouldn't understand the importance of some of the things that you uh, spell out in your book. So just talk a little bit more about your education, if you will. Sure, so as I mentioned, uh, during my college career, I, I worked full time double major, mm -hmm. uh, sped around a lot, got pulled over a lot by police. So I had many encounters with police. Mm -hmm. uh, once I graduated college, uh, was able to sort of <coughs> make the transition from being at the bottom of the class in high school to the top of the class. I delivered the valedictoria address right. at the University of Cincinnati's graduation in 1992. Wow. So 100, 180 degree, t a complete turnaround from you know uh, being at the bottom of the class going to the top then went to University of Virginia for law school. Mm -hmm. Post my law school days, I was a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Mm -hmm. It's actually where case law is made, uh, federal case law is made for the states of Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. Mm -hmm. So in that role, obviously, I dealt with a lot of criminal matters, a lot mm -hmm. of civil rights lawsuits, things that I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. So actually had uh, significant legal experience on those topics. Um, in, a, in, a, in a you know sort of an important role helping a judge to write opinions on those matters mm -hmm. so that's sort of uh, you know my educational background but more importantly just having uh, conversations with my best friend mm -hmm. over the past 25 years that he's been a police officer now one 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 thing I did see I, I read somewhere that you were a public defender no you did Okay, didn't you do some pro bono work? Or? I do, yeah. I have done, I've absolutely done pro bono work. I've, okay. I've filed civil rights, some of the, uh, Section 1983 is a uh, civil rights statute that you can use if you need to sue uh, a police officer for uh, violating your constitutional so what, rights. So where was the focus with the pro bono work? Was it in that arena or just I've done, kind of a I've done nature? Ca I've done federal civil rights cases okay. pro bono okay. on okay. behalf of uh, litigants, indigent litigants. Got you. Yeah. Okay, and that's what I, because I will tell you, I have a connection with uh, an organization out there called Gideon's Promise. Sure. And so that's yeah. why I immediately went to Public Defenders because yeah. I knew the one, I know the wonderful work they do. They do good work. Um, yeah. So, but you guys kind of do the same thing, but you were not a public defender, but more of a pro bono. Corporate attorney who just did that as a community service okay. function. And I still do pro bono work as an attorney. Even though I don't practice law full time, mm -hmm. I'm a business person now, mm -hmm. I still do pro bono cases to keep my legal skills somewhat fresh. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's draw some scenarios. So you're driving along mm -hmm. and you think you're in the car and you think that, hey, I'm adhering to the speed limit. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you look in your rear view mirror and there are the lights going off. And the police officer approaches the car and says, you know, says to you, sir, can I see your license and registration? Walk me through that. The key points we talk about in the book are you want to be calm, mm -hmm. you want to be transparent, and you want to uh, sort of lower the temperature. That so can... do you ask the question, officer, is there a problem? 
You could, it depends. What I normally do in a situation where you're being pulled over, what we recommend is the first thing you want to do is the transparency prong of the approach. Mm -hmm. Turn on the lights so the police, if it's nighttime. Mm -hmm. If it's not nighttime or if it is, put in, in all cases, put your hands on the steering wheel. Put your hands where they're visible mm -hmm. for the police officer. Mm -hmm. And don't get defensive. Let the police officer, I would actually let the police officer say, start the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then what you want to do at that point is you, you don't want to start an argument. Because mm -hmm. number one, you're never going to win that, you're not going to win the argument with the so police officer. So is the idea of letting him start the conversation to kind of, I guess, say, hey, you're in control, or what is what's behind that thought? No, it's, it's, it's actually proper protocol. You want to find out why you're being pulled over. You could ask. if it, it you, Again, you use your best judgment. My recommendation is not to say anything. Put your hands on the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. Let the officer, let he or she tell you what they're stopping you for. Okay. And then at that point, you, again, you want to be transparent. If they're asking for your driver's license, Tell them every move that you're going to make. Mm -hmm. If you think about LeVar Jones in South Carolina, mm -hmm. who was shot by a police officer, the officer t asked Mr. Jones, hey, get me your driver's license. Mm -hmm. As he reached in the car to do that, he got shot. Yeah. Right? He didn't, and, the, and, and so, uh, again, we talk about that in the book. One approach that you can do is inform the officer of every move you're going to make, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It actually helps them. It actually reduces their attention. But he asked him to get the drive, he, and I remember that, uh, reading about that case. He asked him to get his driver's license, so, and he, he's proceeding to do that, and he shoots him. Unconscious bias and his belief in ra an irrational fear mm -hmm. on the propensity of this African-American or black male to behave in a certain conduct. He's reaching in his car, even though I told him to do it, maybe he's going to try to hurt me <laughs> that somehow. That makes no sense at all. Okay. Right. So what if, what, let's turn that around, where the officer asks him to get his license, yep. and he decides, okay, I'm not going to move because this guy may shoot me. I mean, what does he do? What is a person to do in a situation like that? And you again, said to inform him. Yeah, and again, Mr. Jones didn't do anything wrong. Right. The officer was wrong, mm -hmm. but what this book does that nobody else has really addressed is we actually lay out for you why this is important, mm -hmm. why you have to, when the police officer says, hey, Mr. Jones, reach in your car and get me your license, you say, okay, officer, my license is on my front seat where I left my wallet. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I reach in and grab it right now? Mm -hmm. Right? You have to go over and above okay. to be, it's unfortunate. It's a cost we have to pay because mm -hmm. of the legacy of things in our country that we're working through, admittedly, mm -hmm. but it's a reality. Yeah, yeah. And we, we've seen it play out all too many times. So you can take the attitude that, well, no, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And you risk certain consequences happening. Mm -hmm. Again, and again, not to excuse those things. Those things are improper and they should mm -hmm. be punished. Mm -hmm. But we want to get you home. Right. <laughs> I, I have one objective. Yeah, I, my objective is not to... You know, uh, uh, you know, stroke your ego, or mm -hmm. I want you to go home safely. Mm -hmm. I don't want any more cases of Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. I don't want any more Eric Garner cases. Mm -hmm. They're too tragic, and I can't stand having the thought of what happened to those guys play in my head. Mm -hmm. So I want people to get home. Mm -hmm. If you want to get get back, go to survivethepolice.com. We tell you how you can get your revenge in the mm -hmm. proper form. Okay. It's not going to be at the time of the encounter. Okay. Let's, let's um, draw on this a little bit more. He's asked for his, the, the driver's license and the registration, and I've heard different opinions, varying opinions on whether or not you should get out of the car. He asks you then, get out of the car. Do you get out of the car or do you stay in the car? You have to comply with police orders. So, you have so the idea of advising a child, a son or a daughter, um, to stay in the car because I've done that I have a son mm -hmm. and my husband and I told our son do not get out of the car if you've not done anything wrong so that was not good advice well again there's sort of no I hate to use this term silver bullet right mm -hmm. there's no one right way to do it mm -hmm. as a general rule mm -hmm. you want to comply with com police commands okay. just as a general rule just mm -hmm. take that as your starting point mm -hmm. and follow it Okay. So if a police officer says, hey, I need you to step out of the car, you really need to step out of the car. If you don't, again, remember, resistance and hostility 
there's an inverse relationship between your power mm -hmm. and your, your hostility level. Mm -hmm. And or is, resistance level. Is there an them. increased threat when you step out of the car? Um, you don't know what the officer is investigating, right? Okay. Even though the officer may have actually pulled you over for, and I talk about this in the book, mm -hmm. where I got pulled over in w downtown Washington, D.C., or near downtown, and I thought I was being racially profiled because mm -hmm. I was driving an expensive sports car. Mm -hmm. So I figured, oh boy, here we go again. And I got pulled over many times. In fact, I don't drive an expensive sports car for that reason, unfortunately. Uh, or at least and you know, if I can stop you, that's a shame. It is. That's a shame that you have to change your you work for you know what what you have yep and that you have to make a conscious decision that no i can't buy this because a cop is probably going to bother me i mean there's something wrong with that don't you think absolutely absolutely so you change what you des what you desire to drive so that you don't get pulled over because it because having a fancy car is just not that important to me i just made a decision I just made I made a value judgment. Hey, it's just not worth my time. Mm -hmm. I don't you know I don't need to have a fancy car. It was great when I had one, but it was just a value judgment. You you need to make your own decisions on those mm -hmm. things. And I'm not encouraging black men or, or women to get rid of their nice cars. Mm -hmm. Recognize though, but I give a, a very clear story of what happened in that context in terms of again lowering the temperature. Mm -hmm. And the point I was trying to make is that. The police officers were actually very hostile to me in this particular night that I got pulled over, right? They even had their hands on their guns, right? I got mm. surrounded for a vehicle defect. They said I had tent on my windows, right? Which I, I was clueless about that. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turned out, when I called to complain about the incident, a murder had just happened two hours before the street I was on, and the report was a black male in a silver two-door coupe. So the police officers didn't know the make, the model or the year of the car, they just see a black male. I was in a silver two-door <laughs> coupe. And so they pulled me over for a quote-unquote vehicle defect, but then surrounded my car. Now, at the time... What was your response? Oh, I was angry. I was, I was angry, but I, remem I remembered what my objective was. My objective was to leave there without being shot, right? Wow. And so I put my hands on the steering wheel. I spoke firmly to the officer and I wanted to know, you know, why am I being surrounded for this? Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the encounter, uh, I did tell the officer, he decided not to write me a ticket for the tent on my window, which I didn't even know I had tent. It came from the factory. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I never even thought about it. But what, uh, what happened was, um, I, at, at the end, I said, hey, none of you officers can leave. I need all of your badge numbers and names, mm -hmm. which I have a right to do mm -hmm. after things had calmed down. But I had complied with all their commands. Mm -hmm. I didn't move. I was polite. So at that point, I was not a threat to them. Mm -hmm. But then I said, look, I want you all to know I'm an attorney. I need everybody's badge information mm -hmm. because this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. The officer who initially approached me said, well, why don't you come with me? Let me show you what I saw. And he actually tried to make me see his point of view, mm -hmm. which is what I'm trying to do in this book. Mm -hmm. We need to start looking at each other's points of view. Is that when he be, shared with you that a murder had taken place or? He actually didn't. He actually just showed me my back window and that it, and it actually looked like I had tent on my window. Wow. It was a convertible car. I never looked at my back window. I usually had the top down mm -hmm. so I never noticed that but he mm -hmm. actually showed me something and it made sense to me why he stopped me mm -hmm. so but I was still committed to making uh, I, I felt it was an overreach mm -hmm. in conduct mm -hmm. so I felt I called to file a complaint when they told me a murder had happened it actually explained things but overnight I was playing in my mind I was upset I got racially profiled man I can't believe this you can't mm -hmm. you know uh, you go out you work hard you become successful it doesn't matter you still mm -hmm. get pulled over mm -hmm. blah 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 and, and I think that you bring up an interesting point. Um, I think that is something that perhaps the rest of the population doesn't understand in terms of how you as an African-American male has to reprocess everything that should just be real simple. Yep. You have to sit down and really consider, is it this or is it that? That's Do right. I respond in this way or that way? Um, and yeah. You don't like it, but again, you said the point of this book is to make sure that people who do have those encounters go home alive. Yeah, and, 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 and another point. If those officers did something bad, mm -hmm. I would have followed through with the complaint process. Mm -hmm. When I actually got information that they actually were doing something good, trying right. to find a murderer, mm -hmm. I was fine. I okay. never filed a complaint. Okay. 
Let's do another one. Um, oh, this is a good one. You fit the description of a robbery suspect while holding their gun. This meaning the cops are holding their gun. Yep. They have them drawn on you. Yep. What do you do? No sudden move. The first thing <laughs> is no sudden moves. You inform the officer, officer, I intend on complying with all of your commands. Mm -hmm. I have not robbed anybody. If you will allow me to reach in my back pocket to grab my ID, mm -hmm. I'm sure you will realize that I am not the suspect. Is the, is the officer allowed to reach in your back pocket? Depends. Okay. Depends on the circumstances. Okay. If, um, you and I guess the reason I'm asking this question is, is there an instance where you say, my license is in my back pocket, please take it out? It, 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 really, it really depends. I would actually, it depends on the circumstances. If you ask, if the, again, you want to be transparent with the officer, mm -hmm. ask their permission. Is it okay, officer, that I show you my ID? Mm -hmm. And inform them. I believe once you see my ID, you'll realize I'm not the suspect, okay. that my name is John Doe or whatever. And so I think it's about, again, communication uh, and, and, and empathy, understanding the officer at that time is looking for a suspect, mm -hmm. for something. Mm -hmm. And officers operate with limited and imperfect information. Okay. So they're making their best guess as to what they're dealing with, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is this the guy in the silver car? Is this the murderer? Mm -hmm. Is this the person who just shot somebody in the head mm -hmm. that may try to shoot me in the head? Or is this just some guy that fits? And so you have to sort of balance those things. Police work is not, you know, it's not easy work. It's, it's um, and again, this is not to defend misconduct, mm -hmm. but what I want is for people to maybe be a little less offended mm -hmm. by some of the bad things that happen mm -hmm. because some of those offensive uh, behaviors towards you may have nothing to do with you. Okay. Less, we've been talking about encounters in a car. Sure. A lot of our young men are on the street, uh, especially yep. in urban areas. They are, and I go to, let's go out to California, and I'm remembering the Fruitvale Station sure. incident, which to this day when I think about it, it breaks my heart because that seemed so wrong yep. on every level. You're in a situation like that, and there has been a fight on a train, and now you're all there. What should that young man have done differently? What yeah. could he have done differently? Uh, look, I, or I, what would someone do differently in a situation like that? Yeah, part of the book is dedicated to Oscar Grant, yeah. right? And people like Oscar who've mm -hmm. died unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. <sighs> the theme of the book is comply now, mm -hmm. contest later. Mm -hmm. It is unfortunate, but my objective with this book is to get your black father, brother, nephew, uncle, mm -hmm. son home safely. Mm -hmm. So in an instance where there's been a, a, a ruckus event of some sort and police show up and they start giving commands, mm -hmm. you have to comply. And you know, and I hear what you're saying, and part of me is, is saying, I, I guess the large part of me is saying, you're absolutely right. That is what the focus should be. But you're dealing with human beings. That's right. And things happen in the moment. That's right. More often because you may have, looking at the young person's, uh, the young man or the man's side of the uh, point of view, he may have also had a situation That's right. that causes him not right. to think clearly. And I, I guess where I'm leading now, and, and I'm hoping um, we're talking about what the black male or what the male should do in sure. a situation that could wind up turning out poorly. I'm hoping that there's a follow-up book of some type where police officers are now taking responsibility to say, where you're looking at a police officer, what, how, does, how can a police officer look yeah. then differently at people that they are responsible for basically protecting every day. Sure. Uh, let's talk about that because you do, your co-author is um, a police officer. Sure. So what are his thoughts on that? Yeah, let's, let's be very clear. Uh, this book is in no way excuses police misconduct, mm -hmm. inadequate training, mm -hmm. corruption, mm -hmm. no way excuses any of those things. Mm -hmm. Again, we're very focused on the things that you can control. Mm -hmm. And that, that is you can control yourself at the time of the encounter. Right. There has to be appropriate police training. Mm -hmm. And when there's not, we actually, we actually have a strategy in the book of how 
African-American men can literally build a shield and a web of protection around each other mm -hmm. through the complaint process. Mm -hmm. And the you know what, I, w I want to interrupt you there because I want to uh, go to that area of strategy yeah. and talk about things that you can both do on a personal level, yeah. on a community level, and on a national level because I think you have some interesting points that you're making. So we're going to take another quick break sure. and we're going to come right back. All right, thanks. <laughs> When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Eric, we were beginning to talk about, we've talked about encounters and, mm -hmm. and things that people can do on a personal level. Sure. Let's talk a bit about strategy as it has sure. to do with not just on a personal level, but on a, uh, a family level on a community level and ultimately on a national level. What are some of the things you think we can do to change this this whole dialogue and the reactions that we've been getting um, from police officers as it has to do with, with, uh, uh, with uh, hold on a second, as it has to do with citizens? If, if I had to distill down uh, some of the recent events that we've seen and even thinking historically mm -hmm. about uh, some of the uh, injustices that the African American community has suffered, mm -hmm. it, it would I could distill it down into one word, and that's that's value, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it boils down to um, what value do I place on this person, this community? But so there are a number of things we need to do mm -hmm. um, uh, to address that. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to think about uh, what we do inside of our community, how mm -hmm. we talk to each other, how mm -hmm. we refer to each other. Mm -hmm. um, because you really do, you, you kind of teach people how to treat you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I've always you, believed that, yeah. You could, you could make an argument that the prolific use of the N-word mm -hmm. uh, within our community, mm -hmm. within our, our music, mm -hmm. uh, has literally given license to the broader society to devalue us. To devalue us, us absolutely. And, and I understand the attempt to take a, a term that was meant to harm us and make it a term of endearment, to try to take power over mm -hmm. the term. Uh, I would just ask a question, what, have the, what are the results of that? Mm -hmm. What have the results been? How has that worked out for you? Mm -hmm. And I would argue that uh, there's been a devaluation. Mm -hmm. And when you adopt terms like the N-word prolifically and use it uh, mm -hmm. Towards each other, uh, I, th I think it. Uh, I think that um, it raises a question of why should anyone else view you yeah, outside you, of that? When yeah, that's you also how give other people people license to do the same. I, they don't deserve to do that. No, and it's wrong, no matter who does it. But it's like okay, you're basically saying to them, it's okay. This is okay to refer to me like that. Well, it's it's even worse than giving other people license. Mm -hmm. You're actually hurting yourself. Yes. Right. You're mm -hmm. actually you're you're actually by the way. Oftentimes we talk to each other and we treat each other and we view each other. Mm -hmm. It actually is you're hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You, in terms of thinking about how we should speak to each other, mm -hmm. parents shouldn't say to their kids, "You ain't." you mm -hmm. know what mm -hmm. are you we should start speaking value into our kids mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. right and so uh, when um, you know look when God called Abraham he changed his name from Abram to Abraham yeah, right. right to be father of many nations he gave him a name that fit with mm -hmm. his purpose mm -hmm. where does the n-word fit with our purpose as a right. community right how does that drive us into, and again, I know that's not the topic we're, we're here no, for No, 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 but, but you know what, it, it really you, does, it, it goes to the root of why uh, there's a deva devaluation of a people and how we are sending, I, I'm one who, who's very much into messaging, and the messages you put out there are important. The, the African American community has a brand, mm -hmm. okay? I recognize that within the community, we can use the term as a term of endearment. But we live in a broader ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We don't operate in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there are other people looking mm -hmm. at the use of this term mm -hmm. and how we use it and making a value judgment exactly. about what you think about yourself and what you think about the other person. Mm -hmm. Okay, And so my theory is, how do you get a Trayvon Martin verdict? Mm -hmm. 
you allow Tra you you say that Trayvon doesn't have a right to defend himself because you view him as a. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say that Eric Garner, we can choke him because he is a. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to think about what we're doing in our own community mm -hmm. and how we speak to each other and whether or not some of those things are actually given license to mm -hmm. some of the bad things that happen. Again, I make no excuse for police misconduct. In fact, we talk very extensively on how to punish bad police. Mm -hmm. And we have every intention of building this network to get to your uh, question about strategy. One strategy is we talk about, again, on our website, survivethepolice.com. Mm -hmm. we, we, we talk about you filing a complaint. Mm -hmm. Complaints build a paper trail. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So think about Officer Darren Wilson in the uh, Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. If there were 10 complaints on Darren Wilson of using abusive language or calling the N word or anything else, it would be much more difficult for the grand, grand jury, jury yes. to overlook that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important that you go and file a written complaint. And I think you bring up an important point because one of the things that I've heard over and over again in each of the cases mm -hmm. is that there was a history of either that particular police officer or police officers in that community of violating the rights or, or treating the citizens in an abusive manner. But if there is no record of that, so you bring up a very, very interesting point. So I hope you guys are listening out there. If there is a problem in your community, make sure you go through the steps of filing the necessary paperwork so that there is a paper trail in the event something terrible happens like that. Now, you, we're running out of time, but I wanted sure. to, um, if you could, talk about, you've given your website, if you could give that one, once again. Survivethepolice.com. And also, I'm, my mind is going in terms of places where you can take this book and, and really become a resource. Uh, in a big way, and I'm thinking large churches. Sure. Uh, what are some of the other things that you're planning to do with the book? Well, the book is actually being released today. Right. So um, I plan on doing speaking engagements at churches, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. schools, and other organizations uh, okay. to get the word out. Okay. So if you're a large church, because that's where we spend a lot of our time sure. in our community, um, you can go and to his website and, and your contact information there's a, is there. There's a request speaking engagement on survivethepolice.com. You can go, there's a request speaker button. You can okay. push that and uh, we will coordinate with you. Okay, and I encourage you to buy the book, especially if you have uh, young men or young women, because there have been instances of young women having um, unfortunate encounters. Purchase the book. Read it and make sure you comply uh, because the whole idea is to make sure that your loved one gets back home Get alive. Home. Yes. Well, I know when we first talked, I told you we were going to be talking an hour. You thought, wow, that's too much time. <laughs> but yes. I promise you there's so much more we could have talked about. But I am, for one, very, very happy that you wrote this book. And I look forward to seeing uh, the great work that I know is going to come about as a result of your having done so. I wish you Godspeed, and again, thank you so much thank for you. joining us on Metro Magazine, and that's going to do it for us again this week, and uh, be sure if you have any interesting subjects or if there's someone out there who would like to share information with the show, please have them reach out to us, and uh, that's going to do it for us this week, and I will see you on the flip side.